Welcome to night number three of the Blueprint presentation. We are here, we are ready to conclude uh, this presentation. Uh, tonight, as I said, is part three of the Blueprint. Um, if you happen to miss last night or the night before, these have been recorded. You can find them in the Facebook group, um, the uh, Blueprint Facebook group, if you're coming from the group or if you're on YouTube. Uh, you can find them on the YouTube channel. All right, guys, so um, we are going to get right into the presentation today because as we did, as we saw yesterday, um, there was a lot that we covered. There is a lot for us to cover to get to, get to the conclusion of this message. So we're not going to waste a whole lot of time. We're going to jump right in. So we're going to have a word of prayer and then we will begin. So let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that as you... Um, as we conclude this message, Lord, that you would again make your word clear. Uh, Father, open our eyes that we may see. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'm going to share something with you guys. Um, I have been giving you uh, the entire theme of the Bible, the whole scan of, of the controversy that began in heaven all the way down to the end of time, and we've done it in three days. So here's what I'm going to tell you, okay? There is a lot <clears throat> that I have not covered or even mentioned in this presentation. So I want you to see this presentation uh, as uh, containing time-released truths. All right, what do I mean by that? You know when you take a pill and they say the pill is time-released? In other words, it releases certain, you know, certain uh, uh, elements at a certain time in your body. That's what I want you to think of this, pres this presentation as, right? Because I'm giving you a whole lot in a very little time. But as you continue to study these things out, you will probably go back to this presentation and go, oh, that's what he was talking about. Oh, that's what he meant. All right. So <clears throat> if you're sharing this with someone who has heard it for the first time, let them know that time release truth. They will... They'll be studying and see something a week later, a month later, months later. Oh, okay, now it's even making even more sense, all right? Okay, guys, so with that said, we uh, traveled last night, right, from uh, the uh, children of Israel entering into Babylonian captivity, and we came all the way up to the year 1844. Once again, if you're unfamiliar with that time period and you did not see yesterday's presentation, make sure you watch it because when you watch it, this presentation tonight will make, will make more sense to you than hopefully it will tonight. And it will make sense to you tonight. Okay, so we're picking up now uh, the last uh, third of this message, which is going to be focusing on end time events, what's going to be happening from our time all the way to the very end of time. So we're going to begin with a warning that Jesus gave to his disciples, but had an actual dual application. In other words, he was talking about something to come at the end of time. In Matthew 24, this is what Jesus said to the, to the disciples. He says in verse 15, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. <clears throat> let, them which, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. I want you to notice this next verse. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as the world, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, nor ever shall be. So Jesus here is giving a warning about something that is going to happen at the end of time. He says two things. Number one, two things I want you to focus on. Number one, pray. Uh, first of all, when you see the abomination of desolation uh, being spoken of by the prophet Daniel, stand in the holy place. That is the sign for God's people 
to actually leave their homes because of the persecution that's coming. So we need to know what the abomination of desolation is. And we're going to find that out in this presentation tonight. But I also want you to notice something. Jesus says, pray that your flight be not in the winter, nor on what? The Sabbath. Now, very interesting because a lot of people say, hey, you know, the Sabbath was done away with at the cross. But here Jesus is prophesying about events to take place at the end of time. And he, and he pinpoints the Sabbath as having special importance at the end of time. I want you to remember that we're going to figure we're going to see tonight <clears throat> the, the connection between this abomination of desolation and the Sabbath as was kept by Jesus in his days and the disciples in his days. So please keep that in mind. Remember what we learned yesterday. Remember how we learned that Satan entered into Christianity and began to change these various truths that were uh, uh, symbolized in the sanctuary, changed these truths uh, so that they gave off a negative picture of God and gave the idea that God's law can be changed, that God is a vindictive God, that God uh, uh, requires payment for the forgiveness of sins. Remember all that we discussed yesterday. So, at this time, Jesus is warning, listen, this is what you need to look out for. Now, there is a very special message that we began to look at at the close of yesterday's presentation. And this message began to go forward when all these truths that we talked about were finally restored <clears throat> in 1844. We're going to take a look at those messages right now. So the Bible tells us in Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7, it describes here in Revelation 14, three angels giving special messages for the end of time. And I want you to notice verse six and seven of Revelation 14. It says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, now pause for a second. <clears throat> John is seeing this symbolic message going forward at the end of time. And, and the way he interprets it, he says, I saw this angel having the everlasting gospel to preach unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Well, wait a minute. One second. How is this happening at the end of time? How is it happening during you know, the latter days of earth's history when Jesus said back in Matthew 28, take the gospel into the whole world. And when this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, then the end will come. What happened to all the 2,000 years that the gospel has been being preached? Well, listen carefully, guys. Remember what we saw yesterday. Just around the third or fourth century um, after Christ, we saw that Satan began to enter into the church, infiltrate the church, and manipulate the gospel so that the, the gospel that began to go forth in the fourth century, fifth century, sixth century, and onward was a corrupted gospel was a gospel that taught that you had to pay penance in order to be, to be forgiven, that you had to pray through priests in order to have God hear your, or, or forgive your sins, that, that uh, you had to um, uh, go into confessional booths and, and all these different things that were not found in the gospel, that the word of God was not as important as traditions and that you could not read the word for yourself because only the leaders of the church could read and interpret the word. So we saw all this going on. We saw the gospel being changed. We saw big cathedrals and basilicas being built to control the information that people were receiving. They had no Bibles and they had to go depend upon their ministers. So it was a counterfeit gospel that was going into the world. Well, remember, according to the final prophecy of Daniel, the Bible says at the end of this particular time period, all these truths that were, that were uh, uh, corrupted during the Dark Ages would be reversed, would be restored. And we saw from yesterday's presentation that the final truth regarding the law of God regarding the seventh day Sabbath was fully restored in the, 18, in the 1800s, specifically around the years 1844. 
So it is only now that when John sees this angel going forth with the everlasting gospel, what he's saying here is that I saw an angel or I saw the everlasting gospel being restored and now the true gospel going into all the world. That's what we're about to look at. So what is this true gospel found in the three angels messages that go forth into the whole world at the end of time preparing the world for the coming of Jesus. By the way, let me just share this. <clears throat> if you read after this first angel's message and then the second angel that follows and then the third angel that follows, the next thing John sees is Jesus coming on the clouds. What does that tell us? These three angels messages are preparing the world for the coming of Jesus Christ. It is imperative, crucial, that we understand these three angels' messages. Okay, so let's go. The Bible says here, continuing in, in verse six and seven, I heard this angel saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So we're gonna break this message down because you're gonna notice there are four parts to this message. Number one, fear God. Number two, give glory to him. Number three, the hour of his judgment has come. And number four, worship him that made heaven, the earth, the sea and all that in them is. Four parts to this message. Let's break it down. Number one, fear God. What does it mean to fear God? It simply means to reverence God. It means to worship God. And I'm going to share something with you quite amazing here because <clears throat> the call to fear God or to worship him coincides with the first commandment, which says thou shalt have no other gods before me. I think you see it on the screen. Fear God corresponds with the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, you are not to worship false gods or false religions. You are to fear God, the true God who created all things. So it parallels the first commandment. Now, the second part of the first angel's message is this. It says, give glory to him. Give glory to God. I'm going to tell you, beloved, that giving glory to God parallels the second commandment. In the book of Romans chapter 1, verse 22 and 23, uh, Paul writes about the, the foolish who professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. I want you to see here, when we change the glory of God uh, to creeping things and to, to, to man-made things, it is a direct violation of the second commandment, which says thou shalt not make any graven images and worship those things. So fear God, first commandment. Give glory to him, second commandment. The third commandment, or the third clause in this first, first angel's message, the hour of his judgment is come, parallels the third commandment. You say, pastor, how is that? What is the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What does it mean to take the name of God in vain? It doesn't just mean, oh, I used his name while I was cursed or something like that. Listen, in the Bible, name symbolizes character. Name, a name symbolizes character. So to take on the name of Jesus is to take on the character of Jesus. Now, beloved, listen to me. If you are taking the name of the Lord upon yourself and yet not living a Christ-like life, you are taking the name of the Lord in vain. And listen, you are judged <clears throat> by your character. The judgment has to do with your character. So if you're taking the name of the Lord in vain, you are not ready for the hour of his judgment. Fear God, first commandment. Give glory to him parallels the second commandment for the hour of his judgment is come parallels the third commandment remember this many will say unto me lord lord in other words i'm i'm taking you i've taken your name and the lord will say to them i never knew you 
we are going to be judged. The Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know them. Same text, Matthew 7, by their fruits, you shall know them. Then talks about people taking the name of the Lord in vain. We are judged by our fruits. So then, if the first clause, fear God, parallels the first commandment, and the second, give glory to him, parallels the second commandment, and the third, for the hour of his judgment has come, parallels the third commandment, then the fourth clause of the first angel's message, which says, worship him that made heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters, guess what, guys? That fourth clause parallels the fourth commandment, and how do we know that? Because those words are almost lifted directly out of the fourth commandment, which says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy stranger, nor, uh, uh, nor thy cattle, uh, nor... Oh, boy. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking Genesis chapter 2, beloved, verses 1 through 3, where the Bible says that God created all things. But I want you to notice this taken directly from the fourth commandment and the fourth commandment beloved points us to the creator of all things he who made everything heaven and earth the sea and all them is check out genesis 2 1 through 3 check out exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 you will see the phrase right there the first four commandments parallel beloved the first angel's message so the first angel's message is a message going into all the world warning the world trying to tell the world listen the first four commandments of god are going to be a pivotal issue when it comes to end time events if you're with me so far just give me an amen all right we're going to keep moving how do we give glory to god it's right there, beloved, in the sanctuary message. Remember, we've been going through the sanctuary night after night, night uh, Friday night, Saturday night. We have been going through the, med through the sanctuary, and I want you to check this out. The way that we honor, the way that we give glory to God, the way that we uh, uh, adhere to that first angel's message is very simple. It's by dying to self. That's the altar of sacrifice. That's how you give glory to God. It's by purification over our sins. That's the labor. It's by living by the word of God. That's the table of showbread. It's praying for your enemies. That's the altar of incense. It's letting your light shine. That's a seven branch candlestick. And it is keeping his commandments. That's the Ark of the Covenant. This is how we glorify God. All right? So that is the first angel's message. God is basically calling us to get into the most holy place. He's calling us into the secret place of the most high. Psalm 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the most high. What is that secret place? It is the sanctuary of God, beloved. God is inviting us into his most holy place because there in the most holy place, we're going to be protected from the plagues that fall. Everyone's quoting Psalm 91 right now, beloved, but that Psalm has a very specific reference to end time events. Those who are under the protection of God will not have the plagues fall on them. And how do you get under the protection of God? You got to be found, symbolically speaking, in the sanctuary. All right. Let's move to the second angel's message. The second angel's message is found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And the Bible says there, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So here the Bible is describing a power called Babylon. Mystery Babylon. What is Babylon? According to the book of Revelation, Babylon is described as a woman. Now, why is that significant? It is significant because of this reason, beloved. The Bible tells us that in Bible prophecy, a woman is symbolic of a church. I want you to notice the screen. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, the Bible says there, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ um, also loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The bride here, or a woman here, is likened to a church. So when we see in Revelation chapter 14 that Babylon is fallen because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, 
we are now coming to understand that Babylon represents a counterfeit Christianity, a counterfeit church. Are you understanding what I'm saying? This should be very clear, guys. We talked about this yesterday, how Satan infiltrated the Christian church and began to change these teachings. Well, now the second angel is warning us against this counterfeit Christianity that changes the picture of who God is. Now, let me get very specific because the Bible tells us here that this woman, Babylon, is a harlot. Check out Revelation chapter 18. It talks about all nations are having committed fornication with her. She's a harlot. Now, why is this significant? Let me explain. A harlot, very simply, is a woman that ignores wedding vows. A woman that ignores wedding vows. You get the picture, right? She does not take the wedding vow to heart. So what is, why is God calling this woman a harlot? Does God have wedding vows? Absolutely, beloved, yes, he does. What are those wedding vows? Those wedding vows are the covenant between he and his church. What is a covenant? It's the commandments of God. So I want you to imagine God and his bride and they are standing there holding hands and, and here are the vows. Do you promise to have no other gods before me? And the bride's supposed to say, I do. And, 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 and do you promise not to take, uh, not to worship graven images? And the bride is supposed to say, I do. Do you promise uh, not to take my name in vain? And the bride is supposed to say, I do. And then check this out, beloved. When we get to the Sabbath commandment, do you promise to remember the seventh day to keep that day holy and imagine the bride going well you know uh, I don't really know I mean um, isn't that legalism I got a question for you guys I want you to think about this carefully okay are wedding vows legalistic right I want you to imagine ladies that you're standing there with the man you're about to marry and the, the minister says, do you promise to have no other women in your life? And the man goes, what? No other woman? Are you serious? Aren't you being legalistic? How many of you would stay with that person? Let me, let me explain to you carefully, beloved. Wedding vows are bondage if you're not in love. Because wedding vows lock you in. But listen carefully, if you're not in love, they are bondage. Listen to what God is telling us here. Any church that teaches that it is okay to ignore the law of God, God is saying Satan has infiltrated that system and Satan is teaching something that is, at, that is against the gospel. That's why God calls Babylon a harlot. This is exactly what Satan has done. He's entered into the Christian church and began to teach things like, hey, the law has been set aside. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Therefore, you don't need to keep the commandments. Wait, it's okay for me to kill and steal and lie and commit adultery? Oh, no, 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 no. But the fourth commandment or the second commandment, yeah, you can bow down to graven images. That's okay. You're not really breaking the commandments because you're worshiping God through these graven images. No, beloved, listen to me. Satan will try to... If, if we saw yesterday, we saw yesterday that Satan is the one that would think to change God's law and God prophesied it, God warned us about it. So anyone that comes along and tells you, hey, it's okay to ignore one of God's 10 commandments you, or one of those commandments has been changed and God himself changed it. I want you to know that that is not the voice of God. I need you to get that point very clearly. That is not the voice of God. God has already warned us that Satan would seek to do that very thing. So beloved, that is the second angel's message, which is warning against the errors of Babylon. And then comes a third angel's message. And I want you to check this out, beloved, because the third angel's message says this. The third angel followed and said with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in their forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. And it goes on to describe about the mark of his name. And then it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Now I want you to see this beloved, because what the Bible is doing here is it's telling us about two groups of people. 
those who receive the mark or the or worship the beast or his image or his name and those who keep the commandments of God very clear two groups of people guys if you're not keeping the commandments of God as God wrote them then you're gonna fall into that category of people who worship the beast his image his mark or his name now I want you to check this out because there are four things that God is here that God is here warning his people not to do number one worship the beast that's number one number two his image number three his name number four his mark guys you need to see this because remember four things here the worship of the beast is a direct violation of the first commandment which requires us to worship God only the worship of the image of the beast is a direct violation of the second commandment which says thou shall not worship graven images now this beast is not a literal graven image it's a symbolic thing I need you to understand that it is not a literal image that people are going to be worshiping at the, end, at the end of time it's something symbolic therefore this worship is an inner type of worship Number three, the name of the beast, which is directly, vi directly violating or, or I should say counterfeiting the third commandment, which is thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So watch this, guys. If the, if the worship of the beast parallels the first commandment and the image parallels the second commandment or is a counterfeit of it, and the name is a counterfeit of the third commandment, then the mark of the beast must be a parallel of the fourth commandment which has to do with the Sabbath yes the Sabbath by the way the mark of the beast states that no man will be able to buy or sell save he that have the mark the fourth commandment says nobody should buy or sell on the Sabbath Six days shall you labor and do all your work. Labor, what does that mean? That means you're buying and selling. Six days, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Don't do any work. Don't buy and sell on that day. Satan comes along and he says, listen, I am going to enforce something that is going to either force you to buy or sell on that day or make it, Ill or, or, uh, make it illegal for you to actually keep the Lord's commandment. This is exactly what the Bible is. This is why Jesus puts those two things together, the abomination of desolation and pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath. He's saying there's a direct connection between these two things. All right, come on, let's keep going. I want you to see this, guys. Check this out. Notice on the screen, the first angel's message is telling us what to do. Fear God. Give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven, the earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. It's a direct quote from the fourth commandment. Exodus 20 verses 8 through 11. Worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the waters. This is what God did. The second angel's message warns us against the errors of Babylon. And then the third angel's message says don't. Don't worship the beast. Don't worship his image. Don't worship his name. Don't receive his mark. It's a perfect triangle, beloved. It's God showing us, listen, at the end of time, the issue is going to be over the commandments of God, just as it was in heaven. Lucifer trying to abolish the law of God in heaven so that he could do what he wanted to do. The end time issue will be over the same thing on earth all right we're gonna keep moving so I want you to check this out the worship of the beast is an inward action the worship of the image is a is an inward symbolic action remember it's not a literal image the worship of the name of the beast it's something that you would do inward you're not gonna literally like see his name and fall in worship it's it's something that happens inward but the mark of the beast demands a physical action. Why? Because of all the four commandments, that is the only one in which we are required to do something physically. Therefore, whatever the mark of the beast is, it will be something that requires a physical act or denial of a physical act. 
something literal, something physical that Satan will seek to do or to enforce, that's what the mark of the beast is. Remember that we said it is the only commandment or the mark of the beast says you will not be able to buy or sell. Revelation 13, 16, he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now, I want you to listen carefully to this, guys, because God, when he gave the commandments, said that he would write the commandments in our minds and he would bind them upon our fingers. The mark of the beast being received in the mind or in the hand is therefore, listen carefully, a counterfeit version of what God has written in the mind and bind it upon our fingers. That's why it is received in the mind or in the hand. It is a direct contradiction of the covenant, the new covenant of Jesus Christ, and it is something that Satan will seek to enforce. You're saying, Pastor, okay, how is he going to enforce this? Listen, let's keep going. I want you to see this here. I'm going to take you back to the Old Testament. I'm going to show you something. When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, that Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders, and they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of, as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me in the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of a stone, and a law, and commandments, which I, which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. Now, I want you to understand something here, guys. You see, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, he gave them on sapphire stone. What color sapphire? It is blue. It is what, everyone? It is blue. God gave the commandments on blue stone. God gave the commandments on blue stone. So we might say that the Ten Commandments is God's blue law. Are you catching that? The Ten Commandments is God's blue law, or we might say his blue print. Now you're saying, Pastor, why blue? What, what is the significance of blue? In Numbers 15 verse 39, after someone went out on the Sabbath and had broken the Sabbath, the Bible tells us in Numbers 15, 39, that God told the children of Israel that they were to wear blue upon their, the fringes of their garments. And here's what he said in verse 39. It shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and what? Remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. So blue, beloved, symbolizes obedience. It, is a, it is symbolizes remembering to do what God said. Now, out of the Ten Commandments, there's one that begins with the word remember. What commandment is that? That's right, beloved. It is the Sabbath commandment. Listen, blue simply symbolizes obedience to the will and to the law of God. So God has a blue law. Notice what the Bible says in Romans 16, verse 6. It says, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Many of you may remember the game Simon Says. So you know the deal, right? Simon Says, stand up. What do you do? You stand up. Simon Says, sit down. What do you do? You sit down. You say, stand up. No, you don't stand because Simon didn't say stand, right? Now, let's play the same game between Jesus and Satan. Jesus says stand up. What do you do? You stand up. Satan says sit down. What do you do? You don't sit down, right? You're going to obey who? Jesus. Now, listen carefully, guys. Is there any sin in and of itself in the act of standing up or sitting down? No, it's a pretty harmless act. However, listen carefully, who you listen to in this instance can determine your future. Because it doesn't matter if, if, God, if a pen is here and God says touch the pen and Satan says don't touch the pen and you listen to Satan, 
Listen, the issue is not about whether it's the issue is not about is it a good thing or a bad thing to touch pens? The issue was about who you listen to. So if God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that day is the seventh day. But man comes along and says, ah, it doesn't matter. You can do it. You can, you know, let your day be whatever you want it to be. Beloved, who you listen to makes all the difference in the world. Do you think that all this, who would have thought that all this sin came into the world over Adam and Eve's choice to eat from a tree? They didn't kill anyone, right? They didn't go out and commit some violent crime. They simply disobeyed the commandment of God and chose rather to go with Satan's version of things. Are you catching me? All right, come on, let's keep moving. I want you to understand, beloved, this goes right back to heaven. Who will you obey, God or Lucifer? That's what this is all about. So Lucifer does not want us to obey God or keep his commandments, which is the foundation of his government. Let's keep going. I want you to check this out now, beloved, because the Bible tells us what, how this is going to unfold. I know right now you're saying, how can this be? Here in America, like, what are you saying, Pastor? Like, Somehow or another, there's going to be an enforcement of, uh, uh, of this counterfeit version of the Sabbath, an enforcement, a, a, a decree to honor one day instead of another. Yes, a decree to honor the, the, day, the first day of the week instead of the seventh day of the week. By the way, if you go online right now and Google blue laws, blue laws, you will see that blue laws are referring to stores and, and society being shut down on the first day of the week. Isn't it interesting that these are called blue laws? Here's a question, beloved. If God has a blue law, if God has a blue law, and that blue law is pointing to obedience to him, specifically when it comes to resting on, on, on the seventh day of the week to show that you are in sabbatismos with him. Then it would make sense that Satan would also promote a blue law. A law saying, hey, we want to enforce the first day of the week as a day of worship. So that it brings people into direct conflict with the seventh day Sabbath of God. Yeah, that, that makes some sense. huh? Now we know why these are called blue laws. And I'm, I'm not making this up, guys. Go online. Look it up. Blue laws. You will see that they are there. And what God is telling us is just as at the beginning of time, the crisis, the controversy was over one seemingly insignificant thing. Should I eat from the tree or not? So at the end of time, the test is going to be very simple. Will I obey God or will I obey the traditions of men? All right, come on, let's keep moving. So here's how this is all going to go down, beloved. It, it is very clear in the scriptures. The, the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Do we see that happening right now? Yeah, that's been happening for, for, for a long time, right? So there's nothing special about that. And Jesus goes on to say, see that you be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation. Do we see that? Yes, we do. And kingdom against kingdom. Do we see that? Yes, we do. And there shall be famines. Do we see that? Yes, we do. And pestilences. Are we seeing that right now? Yes, we do. And earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. You guys, listen. What is going on right now is just the beginning of sorrows. Jesus said, look, don't be troubled about these things in the way that in the way of what is actually to come, because what's actually to come is going to far outshadow what we may be going through right now or what we've ever gone through in the past. It goes on to say in the book of Luke, chapter 21, puts it this way. Luke 21, verse 25, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. So we're seeing all this happen right now. Then Jesus says, then he goes on to say, then, in other words, after the beginning of sorrows, something's going to happen that's going to lead to this. Then shall they deliver you, up, deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Then he says in verse 15, 
When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. This is what I want to break down right now, guys, because what he's saying here is basically this. All these little things are going to be happening, plagues, I mean, I'm sorry, not plagues, pestilences, uh, earthquakes, wars and rumors of wars, all those things are just kind of leading up to something huge. And what is the huge thing he points out? He points out the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. What is that? And what does that have to do with the commandments at the end of time? Well, listen carefully. Jesus goes on right after he describes this abomination of desolation. Listen to what he says. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now I want you to know something here. Jesus is clearly telling us that the elect, God's people, are going to actually see this. All right? What is he warning against? False Christ and false prophets. Let's keep reading. Behold, I've told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in a desert, do not go forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So why does Jesus say, if they say to you, okay, first, watch out for the abomination of desolation standing in the where? Holy place. And then he says, hey, if anyone tells you that Christ is come and that he is in the secret chambers or a secret place, don't go. Why is Jesus warning that? Listen, secret chambers. If he's in a secret place, listen carefully, guys. In Psalm 91, because we're going to find out what secret chambers represents. In Psalm 91, the Bible says this in verse 1. He that dwelleth, come on, where is he dwelling? He that dwelleth where? Yes, in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with, the feathers of, with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. So in other words, beloved, those that are in the secret place of the Most High, with the Mo this is symbolically speaking, right? In the secret place of the Most High, what is that secret place? It's the sanctuary. It simply means those who are abiding under the will of God. Because we can't go up into the heavenly sanctuary. You get what I'm saying? So those who are in the will of God, the secret place of the Most High, this is where God's presence dwells. He dwells in the secret place of the Most High. So if we're in the secret place of the Most High, who should we be looking for? We should be looking for the presence of God. Notice what Jesus said. If they say to you, lo, he is in the secret chambers. Secret chambers? Secret chambers. Hmm. Secret chambers. Huh. Whoa. Wait a minute, Pastor. Are you saying that Satan is going to come pretending to be... Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's read more. Psalm 27, verse 5. The Bible says here, For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. So let me ask you a question. Do you think the world will be looking for protection if th there's a time of trouble? Do you think they're going to want to find some kind of protection? Yes. And let me ask you something. If someone were to come pretending to be Christ, pretending to be the Messiah, to offer his protection. What do you think the world would do? What do you think atheists would do? Come on, I'm talking about atheists who don't believe in God, who are just like, ah, oh, the Bible is a bunch of nothingness, whatever. For an atheist, seeing is believing. And if a being 
appears miraculously and is performing miracles that no one can doubt and then saying, hey, listen, come to me. I am your protection. Do you think people are going to flock to that? Look at what's happening with coronavirus right now. This is just a mini model, mini model of what the Bible says will happen because the Bible says it'll be a time of trouble such as never was. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, the secret place of the Most High. Come on, let's keep going. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, it makes it very clear. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Listen carefully. Let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come. What day? The day of the Lord. The day that Jesus Christ appears, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God, as God sits where? In the temple of God showing himself that he is God. In other words, Jesus is clearly telling us Satan is going to come and appear as God and the world is going to be deceived by it. This is the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, standing where he ought not. Uh, uh, one of the books, one of the, uh, I think it, I believe it's the book of Luke puts it, this is Satan appearing as Jesus himself. Now watch this, guys. Remember, why was Lucifer cast out of heaven? Come on, let's read it. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Jesus is basically saying, when you see Satan trying to pull off on earth what he got kicked out of heaven for doing, then know that Michael is about to stand up. Then know that Jesus is about to come. It is the last straw. It is the last deception. And it's important for us to understand this, beloved, because when the Bible says of Lucifer, I will sit on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, I need you to check this out. Because Psalms 48 verse 2, verse 1 through 3 tells us this, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised is the city of our God in the mountain of His holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. The Bible says that Mount Zion is symbolically identified as the sides of the north. Where does Lucifer want to sit? He wants to sit on the side of the north, meaning he wants to pretend that he is the king of the great city. Why is that significant? Listen carefully. In Exodus 26 verse 35, the Bible tells us, Thou shalt set the table without the veil and the candlestick over against the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table, that is the table of showbread, on the north side. Guys, listen carefully. The table of showbread was located on the sides of the north. The sides of the north in the sanctuary. Why is that significant? Because a table of showbread was the article of furniture that the priest attended to every Sabbath. Every Sabbath, they changed the bread to a new loaf, new 12 loaves of bread every Sabbath. So the table of showbread on the sides of the north points our attention to Sabbatismos, which is the foundation of the city of the king. Beloved, listen to this. 
According to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, the Bible says, No marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Listen, let me make it plain. When Satan comes and pretends that he is Christ, he is going to say, I'm about to set up a theocracy. I'm about to set up the, the, the city of God, Mount Zion, on the sides of the north. I am the great king that you've been waiting for, and I will set up sabbatismos on earth. I will bring in a great period of peace, peace, peace on earth. And the sign of that peace will be that I will institute a new Sabbath, a Sabbath by law, and that Sabbath will be the first day of the week, a counterfeit blue law, not the true Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And who do you think will be the first ones flocking to this counterfeit Jesus? It will be so-called Christians who did not study their Bibles, but trusted in leaders and the popular thing and all the what they saw on TV and all they try instead of going to the Word of God for themselves, they trusted in what others told them and did not check it out for themselves and said, well, everyone else is doing it, so it must be, it must be right. It, it's, a, it's a tradition, everyone follows it. I'm gonna just go with the popular, I'm gonna go the popular route. Beloved, are you seeing how all this unfolds? I know you're saying right now, yeah, America would never set up a law like that against religious freedom. And of course, yes, they would not. They cannot. Listen, there are Christians right now that are actually fighting for this. But it's not going to happen. Atheists are not going to let it happen. Bottom line. This, this country is too diverse to let something like that happen. In order for something like that to happen, it would have to take a miracle. And beloved, the miracle is the counterfeit appearing of Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that will bring the whole world together. Muslims, atheists, Buddhists, Christians, you name it. Because for many people, seeing is believing and because many people are not studying their Bibles for themselves they are basically open to this delusion when it comes Jesus warned he said listen you need to understand what this abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place pretending to be somebody that he is not that is what Satan tried to do in heaven and that is what he will try to do on earth now beloved I want you to check this out because if you call this Jesus a counterfeit, guess what, guess what the Christians are going to do to you? Remember when Jesus said the time is coming where they that kill you will think they're doing God a service? He was talking about the end times. You get what I'm saying? The foremost, the people that will be foremost deceived by this deception will be so-called Christians. Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. This is the reign, the thousand year, year reign of peace that the Bible prophesied. And many don't even understand what that is about. But beloved, I'm telling you, listen, how do you know this is a counterfeit? It's very simple. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Listen carefully, beloved. When Jesus comes again, Again, his feet don't touch the ground he is not coming to set up a kingdom on this earth not yet the Bible says he stops in midair and calls his saints up to meet him in the air and they go back to heaven with him as we will see the Bible says for 1,000 years the thousand years of peace beloved is going to be is gonna be in heaven and on earth it'll be peace because listen carefully when Jesus comes again, those who are not prepared for his coming will die. Meaning, the righteous go to heaven, the wicked die, and there's no one on earth for Satan to tempt for a thousand years. And that's why the earth is in peace for a thousand years. It's not everybody getting along, hey, and Jesus here on earth. No, 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 no. That's a setup. Please listen to me. Study this for yourself. It's a setup, guys. 
If we are expecting Jesus to come and set up his, his kingdom on earth, Jesus said, listen, I'm warning you. If they say he's in the secret chambers or he's in the desert, go not because as lightning shines from the east even unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. He stops in the air, calls his saints in the air, and we go to heaven with him. Satan will make it appear that he is setting up the millennium kingdom on earth. And beloved, listen, in the millennial kingdom on earth, on earth that he supposedly sets up, this verse will be applied. Isaiah 66 verse 22, for as the new heavens <coughs> and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come before me and worship, saith the Lord. Satan is going to take this verse and he's going to apply it to the first day of the week. And all those who do not come to worship him will be identified as rebels against the kingdom of righteousness and they will be, there will be a decree to put them to death. Catch this, guys. No one will be able to buy or sell except he that receives the mark or the name or the image, the image or the number of the beast. Beloved, this is too important for us not to understand. Listen, we are now, praise God, we are now in the final scene. I want you to check it out, beloved. We're the, these events, we're, we are right at the end of the movie. I need you to keep following. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 38 to 41, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not <coughs> until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. So I'm going to ask you a question. I need you to think carefully. Do you want to be taken or do you want to be left? All right. I know many of you right now are raising your hands and saying, I want to be taken because I don't want to be left behind. But I want you to look carefully at the text. Because the Bible says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. <clears throat> that in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And the Bible says that Noah entered into the ark, and they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. Took them all away. Took them all away. What happened to them? They were taken. Only Noah and his family were left. How many of you want to be left alive when Jesus comes? Yeah, that means you're caught up to meet him in the clouds. Do you catch what I'm saying? Beloved, listen to me. Those who were taken were taken away. And there was no second boat. Listen carefully, guys. There was no second boat. There is no, this teaching of, you know, for those who Jesus comes and he takes, the others are left behind, and they have seven years to get it together. There was no second boat in Noah's day. Those who were taken were destroyed. There was no second opportunity. This is another setup of Satan. Satan teaches false doctrines in order to set you up to be deceived and lost. How many people are out there right now saying, well, you know what, I don't believe in Jesus, but if I see people disappearing, then I'll know that I have seven years to get it together and I'll get it together then. What if that's not true? Beloved, it is not true because the Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that. Jesus says, when I come, those who are ready are coming with me and those who are not ready are going to be destroyed just as it was in the days of Noah. Let's keep moving. So the Bible tells us that Jesus takes his saints to heaven and, and, and uh, they, they meet him in the air. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 20, listen carefully, that at the, at the resurrection of the dead, the righteous will go to, with Jesus, go with him to heaven for a thousand years. According to Revelation chapter 20, Satan is going to be bound in a bottomless pit. The saints will come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Judgment is going to be given unto those saints, but the rest of the dead, that's the wicked, do not live during the 1,000 years. They will actually come to life at the end of the 1,000 years to face their final judgment, and you'll see why in a moment. 
But I need you to see this. Because the Bible says that Satan was cast out into a bottomless pit. Notice what the Bible says here. John 4, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 4, verse 23. The Bible says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. And I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. And I beheld, and lo, the fruitful places was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Jeremiah is here describing the earth in its condition after Jesus comes again. When Jesus comes again, this earth is going to be in an unhabitable, in an unhabitable uh, condition. And Satan is going to be bound. This is what the abyss will be. It's this earth in an uninhabitable condition. Satan is going to be bound on this earth while the righteous are in heaven. And what are the righteous going to be doing, doing in heaven? Judgment is going to be given unto them. This is jury duty time. Remember what we talked about in the first lesson. God created mankind in part to be jurors over Lucifer and his fallen angels. Well, it is here in the millennium where judgment is given unto the saints that they are now seated for jury duty. Now, beloved, listen carefully. In order to be a juror, you must be a law-abiding citizen of heaven. How can you be a law-abiding citizen of heaven if you believe that the law of God, the law of heaven, which is the law of love, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Don't take the, name, the, Lord, the, the, the Lord's name in vain or worship graven images or murder or lie or steal. How can you be a juror if you believe like Lucifer wants you to believe that the law has been done away with or changed or altered in any way? Are you catching what I'm saying? Satan is trying to eliminate you from being a juror simply by messing with your judgment. Because if your judgment isn't right, if your ability to, to determine between right and wrong is not right, if you fall for Lucifer's lies and deceptions, how can you serve on God's jury? You'll be like, well, I don't see anything wrong with what Satan did. Well, yeah, I mean, why not? You'll be, you will literally be the devil's advocate. <laughs> you don't want to be the devil's advocate. Don't be the devil's advocate. There will be no devil's advocates in heaven. You catch what I'm saying? So now check this out, guys. I'm about to show you something absolutely mind-blowing. Watch. Remember what we saw in heaven. Look at the screen. I want you to check this out. In heaven, there was a sabbatismos. Remember that? Yes? <coughs> Sin broke the sabbatismos, the state of peace. Remember that? And then God offered a time of mercy, a 70 times 7. Then there was a time of war or a time of change where Lucifer was seeking to change times and laws and warring against the saints of the Most High, the angels of the Most High. Satan was doing all these things, trying to sit, set himself up as God. Then there was a time of cleansing where Lucifer and his angels were cast out of heaven into an abyss which was this earth before it was created. And why was he cast here? To be judged by newly created humanity. So Satan, realizing that humanity was going to judge him, tried to mess up God's plan and bring sin into the picture on earth. So yes, sin caused a detour in God's plan for humanity. But check this out, guys, because what happened in heaven, we're going to see is the exact thing that happens on earth. In the beginning, there was sabbatismos. All was peaceful on earth. But then Satan brought sin to earth and broke the state of sabbatismos. Is that correct? Yes, God raises up a people and they're rebellious against him for some time. God gives them a time of mercy, a 70 times 7, the 70 week prophecy. Remember that? Yes, you do. Was that followed by a time of war or a time of change in which Satan seeks to penetrate the church of God and, and teach things that were against the sanctuary? Yes, there was. Was there another prophecy that states after 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yes, there was. And at the end of this cleansing, what happens to Lucifer? He is bound in a bottomless pit. What is a bottomless pit? This earth, which will basically be reverted, almost reverted to the condition it was before God created on it. And why is Satan bound there? To be judged 
by newly recreated humanity. Beloved, what we are going through on earth here is a replay of exactly what happened in heaven. And that is why God's people, those who go through this and, are, and, and have their minds on right and have given their lives to Christ, the entire human race that will be jurors in heaven will know by experience because they have lived through different parts of the controversy and it is that experience that allows them to be jurors in heaven, that allows them to understand the process and what the judgment is about. Are you with me so far? Come on guys, let's keep going. We're going to wrap this up. We're almost done here. The Bible says, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Beloved, this is very clear here. The reason why Satan is now able to deceive people on the earth at the end of the 1,000 years is because at the end of the 1,000 years, the wicked come back to life. They are resurrected again because it is here, this resurrection in which the kingdom of heaven is about to come down to earth and the wicked, all of the wicked throughout all the ages are going to face their final judgment. We're going to see that in a moment. So it's not that Satan is suddenly let out of some abyss somewhere up it, somewhere in some other place and now chaos again comes to earth. No. The wicked are dead upon the earth for a thousand years and then Satan and then at the end of the thousand years uh, uh, the wicked are resurrected and Satan has people to deceive again and it is only the wicked. Gog and Magog are in the four quarters of the earth. Four quarters make up one whole. Gog is not Russia. Magog is not China. People come up with, no, Gog and Magog is symbolic of the whole world. And the whole world will be wicked at that time. Why? Because the redeemed are in heaven with Christ for a thousand years where they were judging the wicked. Come on, let's look at it. This, beloved, is where I say Earth's final movie takes place. Because when Jesus comes down, the Bible says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Listen carefully. During the millennium, the righteous will be in heaven, the books will be open to them, and they will get to see why those loved ones of theirs are not in heaven. God is going to show them, listen, this is how I tried to win them, and this is how they rejected the gospel. God is going to show every time someone came to that person's door or someone tried to reach out to that person and say, give your life to Christ. God is going to show time after time I reached out, time after time I sent, uh, I sent someone, I sent angels, I sent uh, people to speak and they rejected and rejected and rejected so that at the end of the 1,000 years, the righteous will say to God, just and true are thy ways. They will have no questions. They will know why everyone who is lost is lost and why all who are saved are saved. At the end of the 1,000 years, when the righteous have gone through the books, this is when the, 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 the great white throne of God <coughs> descends with heaven and the dead on earth are raised to life. And now it is here that the second time, this is the second time the books are open, and now the dead are standing before God. Lucifer is right there with them, right on earth, and God now opens the book so that the wicked can see exactly why they are about to be destroyed for all eternity. God does not destroy the wicked until he shows them in the very books, this is how I tried to win you, and this is how you rejected, so that at the end of that event, even the wicked will have to say, will bow their knees and say, just and true are thy ways, O God. That's why the Bible says, every knee shall bow 
and every tongue confess. And beloved, listen to me. The sanctuary points out the very, the, the, the entire history I just shared with you over the last three nights. The sanctuary points it out. Look at the screen. The Bible shows us, the sanctuary shows us sin was introduced from the very foundation of the world, the altar of sacrifice, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The altar of sacrifice points us to that fact. Check this out. The laver points us to the flood where God had to cleanse the world of sin that first time. Then we get to article, article number three, the candlestick. Jesus is the light that came into the world on account of our sin. The table of showbread. Christ died as the bread broken for us on account of our sin. The altar of incense. Christ resurrected and ascended to heaven to intercede on our behalf. And now at the very end of time, we have that great white throne judgment, which brings us face to face with the Ark of the Covenant and the law of God. Beloved, listen to me. Anyone who fell for the lie that God's law does not need to be kept. Listen carefully. There are people who lived up to all the light that they have and they're going to be saved. No question about it. So we're not saying if anyone did not ever keep the law, did not keep the entire law of God, they're not going to be saved. No, not at all. There are many, many, many well-meaning people, good Christians who have lived up to all the light that they had that were probably bowing down to images and worshiping images, thinking, yes, this is Mary, this is Jesus, and, and they did not know any better. They never had the truth brought to them. The Bible says in times of ignorance, God winks. There are people, listen carefully, there are people who might not know as much as you, but will be in the kingdom of heaven before you get there because you're not keeping up, because you're not living up to what you know to be truth. God judges us based off of the information that we have before us. So don't think, oh, pastor's saying that, you know, my great grandmother, she never knew about not worshiping graven images or she never knew that the Sabbath was actually on the seventh day of the week, not the first day of the week. Guess what? God judges her based off of what she knew, what the information she had before her. And she may be in heaven before many people who do know about the Sabbath or do know about not worshiping graven images, but, but are lying, stealing. You understand what I'm saying? God is no respecter of persons. But okay, come on, we gotta keep going. We are almost here to the end, beloved. The judgment scene happens and now this is the final scene. This is where God is about to destroy the wicked, beloved. And this is to me the most moving scene of this whole movie because God's destruction of the wicked is something that is, that is misunderstood by millions and millions of people. I need you to give me five more minutes 10 more minutes and we're going to be done, all right? So just hang on. Listen carefully. Why does God destroy the wicked by fire? Listen carefully. A look at the screen. The Bible tells us our God is a consuming fire. I want you to know this, guys. <clears throat> Heaven itself is a city of fire. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? See it on the screen again. Our God is a consuming fire. Did you know that God was a fire? I think you knew that. If you didn't know that, you know it now. God is a fire. Um, how many of you would like to dwell in the presence of God? Are you sure you would like to dwell in the presence of God? I hope you're sure because what you're asking to dwell in is in the presence of eternal fire, a consuming fire. Listen, the Bible tells us that the angels are fire. The Bible tells us there's a sea of glass mingled with fire in heaven. The Bible tells us that God's throne is a fiery flame and he invites us to sit in his. Jesus said, you will sit on my throne even as I am set in my father's throne. Let me ask you a question. Are you, do you think you are ready to dwell in a city of fire? And why would God make heaven a city of fire? I'm not talking about fires all, I'm simply saying that the presence of God is like a consuming fire. So why would God manifest himself like that? Listen, do you realize that fire in the Bible is symbolic of love? According to Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7, the Bible says many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. Many waters cannot quench love. Fire in the Bible is symbolic of 
love. So God manifests himself as fire, not because he's trying to scare us, but because fire is heaven's language of love. And it is here too. Because when you're on fire for something, it means you're passionate about it. When you're on fire for someone, when you have a fire burning in your heart for someone, it means you're in love with that person. So the reason God manifests himself as fire is because God is love. So when God created Adam and Eve, they could stand in his presence and not be consumed. Why? Because they had no sin on them. But when sin entered, they suddenly became afraid of the presence of God, of the fire of God. And God knew that had he come to them in his, un in his unveiled manner, that he would have destroyed them. So God now has to initiate a plan whereby man can once again stand in his presence without being consumed. Are you catching this, guys? <coughs> God's desire is for us to stand in his eternal presence, which is fire, meaning God wants us in eternal fire. Oh man, pastor, what are you talking about? Yes, it is true. And I want you to notice, guys, because Satan has flipped this very truth. I want you to notice what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah 33. It says this, verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Watch this. He that walketh righteously. You guys. Wait a minute. I thought the wicked were the ones that dwell in everlasting fire. No, no, no. We got it. You got it wrong, guys. It is the righteous that dwell with everlasting burnings. Why? Because they are able to stand in the presence of God without being consumed. Are you catching this? The devil flips it and says, yeah, God burns the wicked forever. No, 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 no. The wicked cannot burn forever because the wicked are not fireproof. <clears throat> the Bible tells us that the wicked will be turned to ashes. You will see that in a moment, beloved. Satan has taken this teaching that God will burn the wicked forever and ever. And there are more atheists in the world because they cannot reconcile how a God of love can burn people who have lived for maybe 15, 20, 25, 30, 50, 80 years and burn them forever for things they did over a period of 50, 60, 70, 80 years. That doesn't make sense. How can God be a God of love? So beloved, what God ultimately wants is he's trying to get us into a condition where we are fireproof so that we can stand in his presence and not be consumed, not be turned to ashes. And this is why he gave us the sanctuary because I want you to notice something here. Each article of the furniture in the sanctuary was connected with fire. The altar of sacrifice was also called the altar of burnt offerings. Something about the sacrifice of Christ was supposed to set us on fire. The table, the altar, the, the, the laver, I'm sorry, was about baptism. And John the Baptist said that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Listen carefully. What does it mean to be baptized in fire? It means that you go just like in water baptism. You go down covered in water. You come up wet. With fire baptism, you go down in the fire of the Holy Spirit and you come up surround. You come up on fire. You come up fireproof. That's what God's trying to make us. He's trying to make us fireproof so that when he comes again, we will not be running from him. We will be able to see him as he is and not be consumed by the brightness of his glory. The table of showbread. Jesus tells us that the word, God tells us that the word must be like a fire in our bones. The altar of incense, beloved, needed fire for the incense to burn. In other words, God says we must pray with fire. We must be praying with fire. The seven branch candlestick, let your light shine, let your fire shine. Every article of furniture, including the law of God, which the Bible says was written in, with his finger 
as a fiery flame, the Bible says the law was written in. Every article of furniture has something to do with helping to set us on fire so that when Jesus comes again, we will see him as he is. Just as he is coming in fire, we will be symbolically covered in the fire of the Spirit and we will not be afraid to see him as he is. I hope you're catching this, guys. Because the Bible is basically telling us that at the end of time, when God destroys the wicked, he's, he cannot let them into heaven because heaven, listen carefully, he cannot let them into heaven because heaven would be hell for them. And God loves them too much to burn them forever. So the reason you, he cannot let the wicked into heaven is because they are not fireproof. So what does God do? At the very end of time, God with his great big fiery arms will embrace the wicked one last time. And in that fiery embrace, the wicked will feel what it would be like to live in heaven with a holy God while sin is still in them. The Bible tells us that they will be tormented in his presence, not because he is tormenting them though, beloved, but because they have sin on them and to stand in the presence of a holy God, to stand in the presence of a fiery God, a fiery God of love, while you have hate and animosity and anger in your heart, it's going to be torment. The torment they will feel will lead them to cry out, blot us out. Listen to what the Bible says. The wicked, Psalm 37 verse 20, the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of the lambs. They shall consume into smoke shall they consume away. Some people take this text in Revelation chapter 14, which says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they believe that what God is saying here is that the wicked are being tormented forever and ever. No, beloved, it's the smoke of their torment that is ascending forever and ever. Listen. The Bible tells in Psalm 37 verse 20 that they are consumed into smoke. And that's, we don't understand how, but that smoke will be the only thing left of the wicked. They cannot burn up. Why? They cannot be burning forever. Why? Because the Bible says in Malachi 4 verse 3, And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord. Listen. You can't burn something that no longer exists. If the wicked become ashes, they cannot be being tormented forever and ever. It is a smoke of their torment that ascends forever and ever, but they themselves turn to ashes. And that is the only humane thing, divine thing that God can do. Because listen, heaven cannot be heaven while you know that your loved one is being tortured somewhere else in the universe. The, the, the lake of fire, fire comes down from God out of heaven and consumes the wicked right here upon the earth. The wicked, the earth is then totally transformed. But check this out, before that happens, the Bible even says of Lucifer, look at what it says about Lucifer. Ezekiel 28 verse 18, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Satan himself will be turned to ashes. He will cease to exist. So if Satan will cease to exist, why would God have humans who were only living for 50, 60, 70 years, existing forever in a lake of fire. By the way, Satan is not in charge of hell. You know, pitchfork, I'm in charge of hell. God gave me an agreement, helped me, you know, put me up in charge. No, 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 no. The Bible says Satan himself is destroyed, turned to ashes. And listen, beloved, once the wicked are all destroyed, the Bible then says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and first earth were passed away and there was no more sea, including no more sea of fire, no more lake of fire. Everything is done away with. The wicked are ashes. They cease to exist. 
God recreates a, a, a new earth and the righteous now have their home on this new earth. And the Bible then tells us, what, you, what do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Sin will cease to exist forever and ever. There will be no more transgression. And the Bible tells us, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I should, will make, save the Lord, shall remain before me, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, save the Lord. It will be an eternal sabbatismos again. Beloved, you have just watched, you have just watched Earth's final movie. Last night, the night before, you put all this together, beloved. And if you can get this in your mind, the Bible says in the book of Revelation 22, blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. Listen, Lucifer was cast out of heaven because he refused to keep the commandments of God. That's, that's the very beginning and at the very last book in the very last chapter, God says, if you missed the whole movie, if you missed the whole Bible, I need you to remember this last thing, this thing in, in Revelation 22, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. Beloved, I appeal to you tonight. You have just received truth that is time-released truth. You have heard a lot of things tonight. You heard a lot of things yesterday. You heard a lot of things Friday night. And beloved, you're going to have to chew on a lot of this. I've, this kind of stuff, we usually take like four weeks to break this kind of stuff down. I've just condensed it to you in three days. But I just need you, I'm making an appeal, not for you to just make a decision now if you're not convicted, but I need, to, I need you to make a decision to say, you know what, the person who, who brought me here, the person who told me you gotta watch this, I'm going to start asking them questions. Hey, tell me more about this. Tell me, what, what did the pastor mean about, you know, what happened in 1844? Can you explain? And, and whoever you talk to, if they can't explain it to you, they will get someone to explain it to you. But I'm pleading with you. Come now, let us reason together. If this is truth, if this is truth, I'm not asking you to, to, to believe me blindly. I'm simply saying, search it out for yourself. Salvation is too precious for you to leave it in somebody else's hand. Search this out for yourself. yourself. Study to show yourself approved. If you can do that for God, if you can just say, Lord, I promise you, I'm gonna study this thing out. I'm gonna study to show myself approved. I'm not gonna come studying this like trying to disprove. I'm gonna say, Lord, if this is truth, I need you to show me. Beloved, if you do that, I guarantee you, God will show you truth. God will show you truth. I want you to look in the link uh, of this video. You're gonna see where you can download the notes for this entire presentation. You can download the Prezi, the, 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 uh, the keynote or Prezi version of this presentation. Actually, it is just the Prezi uh, version or you can get the PDF. But if you wanna study this out, if you wanna go through this with the person that invited you or the people that invited you, beloved, you owe it to yourself. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. I thank you for watching. I pray you've been blessed. Go back and watch this again and again and again as much as you need to. And I pray to see you in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to reason together, Lord. I pray that these messages will go out into the world, will go from home to home especially in this time of lockdown. May eyes and hearts be open. May we see and understand what is coming. As unbelievable as it sounds, this is not conspiracy theory, this is Bible. Lord, please open the eyes of your people who are now being misled. They are your people, Lord. You said that you have people in these systems that, that are being misled, but nonetheless, they are your people. And you say, come out of Babylon, my people. Lord, may our eyes 
all be opened. May our hearts all be drawn to you. May we see the truth and follow it. And we thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering this prayer because we ask it in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen.